Our next speaker is Associate Professor Lee Waters, uh, Melbourne Graduate School of Education here at the University of Melbourne. She's the Director of the Master in School Leadership and the Director of Positive Psychology Programs for the Undergraduate Curriculum here at the University of Melbourne. She's consulted for multinational and national organisations across industries such as banking, investments, retail, professional services, health, education and sport. Please welcome Lee Waters. Okay, thank you, Richard. And um, the topic of my presentation today is mental health for young children. Um, before I talk to you about, am I doing this right? Mental wellness in our youth, unfortunately, I need to talk to you a little bit about unwellness in our youth. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the latest figures from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. But those figures show us that 26% of young Australians are currently experiencing symptoms of mental illness. That's over a quarter of our population of young people who are experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety, eating disorders, addiction, self-harm, the list goes on. And it doesn't look like this situation is going to get better anytime soon. In fact, the World Health Organization says that by the year 2030, depression will be the single biggest health burden globally. 50 years ago, the average age of onset for depression was 28 and a half years of age. Currently, the average age of onset for depression is just 14 and a half years of age. And I don't know about you, but when I read these statistics, and I have to keep a brief of these statistics in my role, I get really, really upset. And I put a call out to all of us, what more can we be doing to help the mental wellness of our young children? Now, in my field, psychology, the typical approach to treating mental illness in young people is known as a treatment approach. And in a treatment approach, what we do is we wait until someone is suffering from a mental illness, and then we work with that young person using our psychological therapies and processes to treat the illness. The treatment approach is critical, but it's not enough. A second approach that is gaining more funding, more research, more interest and more practice is known as the prevention approach. In the prevention approach, as the name suggests, what we seek to do is work with masses of young children to teach them the psychological skills, the mindsets and the resources that they need to prevent the illness from occurring in the first place. Professor Martin Seligman, who's the leading proponent of the field positive psychology, which is the field that I conduct my research into, refers to this approach as psychological immunisation. If we're going to take a prevention approach, then we need to have a very clear understanding of what are the factors that contribute to mental illness or mental wellness in young children. And here we turn to the large scale epidemiological research conducted by Professor Corey Keyes in the United States in the field of public health. And importantly, what his research shows us is that there are two pathways that contribute to mental wellness. The first pathway, is to remove the negative things in an individual's life, is to seek to reduce suffering, seek to reduce misery, work with uh, people to reduce symptoms of depression and anxiety. So for example, as a psychologist, if a young person comes to me with depression, I might pull on um, one of many different psychological therapies. I might choose to use a cognitive behavioural approach and work with that young child to help them understand the relationship between their thinking and their emotional state. And in doing that, hopefully, I seek to uh, cure that young person of depression. But what Professor Corey Key's research shows us is that adopting this pathway in and of itself is not enough. What he suggests is that when we adopt this pathway, what we do is we take someone from a negative state up to a neutral state. So in the case of that young person, they're no longer depressed. We've taken them from a negative state. But does that automatically mean that that young person is a happy, healthy, thriving, flourishing person? According to Corey Key's research, no. What we've done is we've made them no longer depressed. And there's a difference between being happy and being no longer depressed. So we've taken them from a negative state up to a neutral state. Importantly, what his research showed is that in addition to this first pathway, we need to bring in a second approach. And the second pathway is about deliberately, strategically, systematically bringing in positive states into a young person's life. 
So again, if I'm working with that young person and I use a CBT treatment to help reduce the symptoms of depression, what Corey Keyes' research shows is that in addition to that, I also need to bring in positive psychology therapies to deliberately up-level feelings of hope and optimism in that young person. So it's not simply about taking away depression, it's also about bringing forward things like hope and optimism. So what Professor Corey Key's research shows us is that the presence of wellness is not simply the absence of illness. The presence of wellness is something above and beyond the absence of illness. If you use the metaphor of a garden, if you want to create a beautiful garden, you don't just remove the weeds. You also bring in positive things like good quality soil, fertiliser, sunlight, water. If we're going to be working with developing prevention programs to ensure the mental wellness of our young people, we need to adopt both pathways. The problem in my field, psychology, is that 95% of the research that's currently conducted focuses on the first pathway. 95% of the research that's conducted in the field of psychology focuses on the negative states and how we reduce or take them away. And what that leads to is the following situation. <laughs> you know, and it's true, it's a humorous cartoon, but it's actually the reflective of the field uh, of my field, the field of psychology. As a psychologist, I was required to train for eight years at university. And in that eight years, I learned detailed knowledge of everything that can go wrong with the human psyche. I learn about our disorders, our diseases, our illnesses, our pathologies, our maladies. And I've, this year marks 20 years of me being a psychologist. So I've had two decades of practice at understanding what can go wrong with the human psyche. And essentially, in a nutshell, what I've been trained to do is to work with people to help them figure out the problem and fix the problem. And I've done it for so many years that I now find that I do it even when I'm not at work. So, so if I was to go to a party with you afterwards, after, let's say we go to a party afterwards, whether you know it or not, I probably leave the party in my own mind diagnosing at least half of you with some kind of <laughs> problem. You'll have an attachment disorder, you'll have a personality disorder, you'll have some issues from your childhood. And the, tr the truth is, I know I'm not much fun to be around really, but the, tr the truth is that we do all have problems. We do all face challenges. We do all have insecurities. But by equal measure, we also all have promise. We all have possibility. We all have potential. We all have courage and humanity and wisdom. So if we're going to be designing wellbeing programs for young children, it's not just about helping them to identify their problems and remove or fix their problems. These wellbeing curriculums also have to help young children to identify their strengths and identify their virtues and identify the positive things that they can bring in to ensure their own wellbeing. And as a psychologist, I'm faced with the daily choice of what do I choose to focus on in human nature? Do I choose to focus on the problem or the promise? Do I choose to focus on the burden or the blessing? And the truth is, we need to focus on both. Question is, if we're going to design these wellbeing curriculums that are balanced with both the negative and the positive, how do we do this? How do we get access to wide numbers of young people? And I believe that one of the answers is schools. If you think about it, aside from family, and Nick's just talked to, not talked to us about the importance of family, school is the place where a young child spends the majority of their time, from the age of five to 18 five days a week at school. Now, traditionally, schools saw themselves as being responsible for developing our academic skills. But more and more, schools are seeing that they are also responsible for helping young children to develop their well-being skills. And what I would like to see is a situation where it just becomes normal for every single Australian child who goes to any school across Australia that there is a well-being curriculum, that there is this prevention approach that it becomes a normal part of the course of your life at school. Tuesdays, period five, you have math class. Wednesdays, period two, you have geography class. Thursdays, period six, you have wellbeing class. It just becomes a normal part of what we learn at school. Question is, if we start to teach this wellbeing curriculum, does it work? 
Now, wellbeing curriculums are not new. They've actually been around for about three decades under the banner of a movement known as the Social Emotional Learning Movement. But Professor Mark Greenberg in the United States, who's a leading proponent in that field, readily admits that for the first two decades of that research, the wellbeing curriculums that were designed were focused on the first pathway. They were focused on allowing children to identify problems and fix them. And essentially, what we were working with with children is teaching them the skills of emotional regulation so that those children could learn to regulate their own anger and feel less stress and feel less aggression and be um, more socially responsive so they're not bullies. So it's all about that first pathway. Now, with the advent of positive psychology, we're starting to see new curriculums designed that also look at the second pathway that look at how do we increase and up-level positive states, positive resources, positive relationships for young people. In my own research, I've been focusing on wellbeing curriculum that focuses on that second pathway. And I've also reviewed programs that are currently available that are designed not to reduce stress or anger, but are specifically designed to help a young child develop hope develop optimism, develop gratitude. And what I'm finding in my research and review of, of other researchers is that these programs work. Now we need to be cautious in our conclusions because the field is very, very new, but I think that we can be cautiously optimistic because what we're finding is that when we put students through these wellbeing programs, when they learn how to manage their own wellbeing, not just from the negative perspective, but from the positive perspective, they're reporting higher levels of wellbeing. And I see this, and this is why I've drawn it this way, I see it like an armour, like a cloak, like where these children are developing hope and optimism and positive states that they can use as, a, as an armour against life's challenges. Because it's not about ignoring life's challenges, we can grow and learn a lot from life's challenges, but it is about meeting those challenges with a psychological toolkit, meeting, meeting those challenges already cloaked in hope and optimism and gratitude, for example. And here's an interesting side effect that happens when we teach wellbeing to young children. These wellbeing curriculums show that not only do these children report higher levels of wellbeing, they actually do better academically. And large scale research in the United States with over 270,000 students showed that those students who had been put through a wellbeing curriculum at school, on average, did 11% better in their academic achievement tests. And here's a second interesting side benefit. When we work with young children or school students right through to adolescence, and we help them to learn the skills of wellbeing, not only do they report feeling good, but they also become more pro-social in their behavior. And what this means is they become kinder, they become more compassionate, they seek deliberately to support their friends and up-level the wellbeing of their friends. And what I find fascinating about this is that we start to see this transfer process. So we work with one young child to make them feel good, and because they feel good, they transfer that learning on to their friends and their family. So it's like a contagion effect, like a positive virus. So in conclusion, what I would hope to see is that we get more research more funding, more researchers into this very, very important field, that we're developing evidence-based wellbeing curriculum that comes and is just a normal part of every child's schooling. So that what we see is the spread of a positive virus across schools and across society. And then in 10 or 15 years time, as this wellbeing curriculum starts to take effect, we're graduating masses and masses of young people who feel good, who function well, and who go on to do good in society. So that in 10 or 15 years time, if I'm asked to come back and give this presentation again, I don't have to start by saying that 26% of young Australians are currently experiencing a mental illness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee.